Well, we're continuing a series uh, about happiness, and we're going through a book in the Bible called Philippians, and we made it to chapter 3. And here in chapter 3, the writer, whose name is Paul, who was one of the early church leaders, he gives us today five more habits of happiness. And what I'm going to show you today is that all five of these habits can be practiced during a, a daily quiet time with the Lord. You can do all five of these things just in the 15 minutes or so that you bow your head before God each day. And I, I want to promise you something. If you build these five habits into your life, your happiness will go up and your unhappiness will go down. This comes with the Fraser Murdoch guarantee. <laughs> well, let's read the text first. It's Philippians chapter 1. It will appear on the screen. And uh, I'll read the whole text and then we'll come back. All right, it's a little bit longer, this one, but let's go ahead. Chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 1. It says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Now, again, that's our theme. Rejoicing, joy, happiness. That's our theme. He says, I tell you again, rejoice in the Lord. And it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It's a safeguard for you. Here's our, his warning. He says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators, of the flesh for it is we who are the circumcision we who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh though I myself have reasons for such confidence I like this part he says look if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh I have more and then he lists all his reasons I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider that everything is a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, to become like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. A lot going on in this passage, but I want to show you that he says, here are five daily habits, five things that if you build these into your life, your joy will increase. Let's get straight into it. If you're using the notes, write this in. Number one, the first habit that will make you more happy every day is if you learn to just relax in God's grace. Watch this. To relax in God's grace. Do not try to gain God's approval. Don't try to earn God's love. Don't try to think that you can behave your way into the smile of God. Because that always leads to unhappiness. When you're living your life thinking, I've just got to be a good boy. I've just got to be a better, a better girl. I've just got to be more of what it is I have to be. And then maybe God will like me. Maybe he'll love me a little bit more. That is called religion. And Jesus Christ did not come to bring religion. He came for a relationship. What is the difference? Religion is what I do for God. But a relationship 
is what God has done for me. And the Bible is all about what Jesus did on the cross through his death and resurrection on my behalf. Paul says this in verse 3 that we just read. This from the Living Bible translation of the same passage. But he says this, We Christians, we glory in what Christ has done for us and we realize that we are helpless to save ourselves. Notice again, he says, we glory in what Christ has done for us. Why don't you circle that? Has done. Do you notice that's in the past tense? We glory in what Christ has done. That's why the last words of Jesus on the cross, he yelled out, it's finished. Which is also translated paid in full. It's completely done. The difference is that every other religion in the world is a religion of do. And they just all have different lists of things you have to do. Keep these rules, keep those rules, you know, do these things, do that. Do, 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 do. And then maybe you can ascend to some higher energy or maybe you can appease the angry gods. Every religion is about do, do, do. And Christianity is about done, done, done. That's what he says. We, we are helpless to save ourselves. And listen, if you're new to this, you can't get anywhere until you first recognize your need. Until you can be honest with yourself and recognize, you know what? Even when I try to do, I still can't do enough. Listen, I bet you're like me. I don't even live up to my own expectations of myself. Never mind the perfect expectations of, of God in heaven. And when you come to that recognition of saying, you know what, I'm helpless to save myself. And what Paul's saying is, if you would just give that up, if you would give up that, that fading, that striving, that energy, and just learn each day to just relax and rest in the goodness and the grace of God, your happiness will go up. There's a version, a modern version of the Bible. It's a paraphrase, but it's called the message version. And I love what it says. It says, we couldn't carry this off by our own effort, and we know it. You know, unfortunately, sometimes Christians have this reputation in the world of being kind of, you know, judgmental. Sometimes that's with good reason. Hmm. I wonder if we should just get a big sign outside the church that just says, we're not perfect, just forgiven. And just try to remind people, we're not the ones that are here because we think we're perfect. We're the ones here who've actually admitted that, we're, that we don't have it. We're not enough. And just like a hospital is a place for sick people, church is a place for sinners. We don't have it. And we'll never make it by our own efforts. Now what I want to do with each of these five things is I want to give you a trap to avoid. Because when you try to, to live these things, there's always a trap that will take you down. And so the trap of trying to live in God's grace is this. Write this down. The trap is called legalism. And we read about legalism in what Paul said through verses 2 and 6. And it's a little technical, and I don't want to get too down into it. But he starts going on about how he had tried to you know, live the right life. And if you were to read through the things he talked about, he said, look, I'm from Israel. I'm a Jewish guy. But not only that, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the really important tribes. And not only that, but I'm a Pharisee, which is one of the top teachers of the law. And not only that, but I was really zealous about persecuting the church. And he goes through this list, and the list, you could define it like this, and they all start with the same letter, which is rituals. He said, I had all these rituals, and I was of the right race. And I had the right religion, I was Jewish, and I kept all the right rules, and I had a great reputation. And that's why a lot of people think you ought to live your religious life. Keep the rituals, be of the race and religion, keep all the rules, and have a great reputation. What is legalism? Legalism is that attitude that says, i got to prove my love for God. Legalism is trusting in what I do instead of what Jesus did. Legalism is saying, if I just trust the right rules and the right regulations and I keep the right rituals, and, and, oh, and, the right, and here's another one, restrictions. 
A lot of people think Christianity is about all the things you're not allowed to do. Oh, that's a good Christian. Don't drink, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. You know, like it's just all the things you don't do. And so here's what those people think. Well, if, if I can just keep the Ten Commandments, right? If I can just keep the Ten Commandments, then I'll be right with God and God will let me into heaven. Well, number one, you can't name the Ten Commandments, let's be honest. So never mind, you're not going to even keep the Ten Commandments. And, and the Bible says that once you've broken one of God's commands, you're counted as guilty of having broken them all. You say, well, one, oh, don't commit adultery. Well, Jesus said, if you look lustfully upon a person in your heart, it's like you've committed adultery. He says, if you're, if you're angry and mad with someone, that's the same as having murdered them in your heart. So we're all guilty, and none of us keep the Ten Commandments. Did you notice Paul, when he listed it all, verse 3 through 6, he's like, he's like, before, I, he's like before I was a Christian, I was a legalist. That's what he's admitting to. In fact, he was a professional legalist. That was his job. And he said, I tried to, to earn God's approval through rituals, race, religion, reputation, and rules, and it wasn't working. In fact, in verse 6, look at this on the screen. In verse 6, he even said this of himself. He said, in legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. Now, I don't know if he was actually faultless, but the fact that he said so proves that he was a legalist. He said, I was a rule keeper. Now, by the way, how do you know if you're a legalist? How do you know if you keep slipping into legalism? Well, here, here's one of the telltale signs. If you're a legalist, you find yourself being very judgmental of other people. And you tend to be kind of harsh on other people. And any, listen, anytime you see somebody who's like that, who's just kind of quick to, to comment and judge people and with that attitude, the, I tell you the reason they're, that they're really like that is because, well, because I'm not measuring up and, and I'm not happy about it, so I'm darn going to make sure that you're not measuring up either because I don't feel loved and accepted. So I don't want you to feel that way either. And so I'm going to take my own sense of self-judgment for not keeping all the rules and I'm going to project that judgment onto you. How do you know if you're living by grace on the other hand? Well, you're gracious to others. When somebody is living by grace, they are more gracious to other people. They say, well, God's forgiven me, so I forgive you. God has been good to me, so I'll be good to you. I was talking with someone just this week who's in a bit of a pickle and a bit of a messy situation. And I said to him, I don't care. I meant that in a nice way, you know. It's like, I don't care. I don't judge you. I don't feel any, anything different towards you than I did five minutes before you told me. I, it doesn't matter. Now, that attitude, I'll tell you what. A few years ago, some other pastors came and, and they sort of accused me of being liberal. Which if you're in the church world is like the worst thing you can be accused of, right? Well, you're, you're Fraser, have you gone liberal? <laughs> like, have, have you, I think he's going off the deep end. So, he, so here's what I was thinking. If, if there's a cliff on either side and one cliff is just to be too judgmental and too harsh and, and too, too, too down on people and the other cliff is to be too gracious and too generous and too forgiving on the other hand, I just know that when I get to heaven, if I'm going to get it wrong, I want to get it wrong by being too much on this side than being too much on that side. Are you with me? Because guess what? There but for the grace of God go I. Every one of us is just one decision away from being where my friend is now. Don't live by legalism, live by grace. By the way, legalism will suck the joy out of your life. You ever been in a legalistic church? Legalistic churches have no joy. There's no happiness in the church. Why? Because the people are, are there mainly out of duty, out of guilt, out of shame, things like that. But when you finally realize, 
I cannot do anything to make God love me any more than he already does. And when you finally live by that and stop striving to try and prove yourself, your happiness will go up. He says it in verse 9 again, Philippians 3, verse 9. He says, but I no longer count on my own goodness or my ability to obey God's law. Instead, I trust Christ to save me. He says, for God's way of making us right with himself. It's through faith, not through obedience. Many of us, we want to obey our way into faith. But it is faith that will lead us to obedience. I no longer count on my own goodness, but I trust Christ to save me. What is that? That's relaxing in God's grace. Why don't you wake up in the morning and just Say, Lord, I'm just going to remind myself today that I am completely forgiven, that I'm your child, that you love me unconditionally. And why don't you just start your day like that? You think that you'd start the day off better by just reminding yourself of the truth of what God says about you? Of course you would. And your happiness will increase because I'm not striving, but I'm relaxing. Now, in the Bible, the word joy is actually the Greek word kara. And in the Bible, the word for grace is the word charis. Kara and charis, that comes from the same root words. In other words, joy and grace have the same root word. If you want to have joy in your life, you have to experience grace. They go together. In the next verse, verse 7, we get the second habit of happiness. Number two, if you want to build happiness in your life, remember what matters most. Every day, I need to remember what actually matters. When I get up in the morning, I need to remind myself what counts and what doesn't count. I, I can't let myself be distracted by the inconsequential stuff in life. What, you know, what's petty, petty and what's trivial, the stuff that just doesn't really matter. You think, well, why, why is that important to my happiness? Well, you know this. Have you noticed that it's it's easy to lose your joy over just some little things. Just tiny little things will lose your joy. Just small irritations. Like you, you, you feel perfectly happy and content about your day. And then, you know, someone cuts you off in the middle of the lane or you're trying to pull, you're trying to pull a lane to get to the, to the, to the uh, exit and they won't let you in. What happens? Your joy goes out the window, doesn't it? You, you can lose your joy of little things. You have a bad hair day. I, I've heard that's a bad thing. Uh, uh, you know, or, or, you know, your clothes don't quite fit you like they did the last time you put them on, right? I mean, that'll take your joy right away. But you know what? You know what? Is that important in the grand scheme of life? It's not. These tiny little things that just sometimes irritate. Can I tell you one of the things that really irritates me? is when you have to bend down behind something to try and get the, the plug thing in the wall. You know that, you know, like it's maybe behind a desk or behind the, t you know, you've got the TV cabinet thing and, and, and you've got the plug and, and you're like down behind it and you, you're looking at me like I'm an idiot. You know what, you're with me, Herman? Like, isn't that super annoying? Man, I just all my happiness goes out the window. But if we want to see our happiness go up, we have to start remembering, well, what actually matters? Like, what actually counts in life? And in verse 7, Philippians 3, verse 7, Paul says this about all the stuff that he used to think was important. He says, all the things that I once thought were so important to me, I now consider worth nothing because of Christ. All those things that I thought were so important, I now consider them nothing. Let me ask you, in your life, what things or what thing did you consider most important before you knew Jesus Christ? What was it? Work? And career? Making money? Maybe it was getting a date? Maybe it was being popular? Maybe it was having security? Becoming famous, I don't know, whatever it was. You, you have something and that was, that was what was important. Your job. 
And Paul says, you know all those things? It's just not important to me anymore. He's saying, I'm just, I'm not running the rat race anymore. Because you know the thing about that is, and that's what our bumper video is all about, the video before about the rats. The thing is, if, if you run the rat race, even if you win, you're still a rat. Right? One person said one time, he said, I spent my whole life climbing the ladder of success. And when I got to the top, I realized it was leaning against the wrong wall. He says, if you want your happiness to go up, you have to know what is actually important. I don't have to be keeping up with the Joneses, especially as they probably just refinanced. (laughs) And so Paul says, all these things that were so important, being cool and looking cool and, you know, having the goods, feeling good, looking good. He says, it's just not important anymore. And why is it not important? Why is it no longer important? Because it doesn't matter in the long scheme of things. That's what he's talking about. Listen, how do you know if you've been saved? How do you know if you have really been saved by Jesus Christ? I'll tell you how you know. Your values change. Your values change. If your values have not changed... I'm not sure you've been saved. Because you cannot have someone as big as God come into your life and not make a difference. It changes your values. All those things that you used to think were so important. Paul says, I don't care about them anymore. Let me tell you a story from my own life. I, I became a follower of Jesus as a young adult. And I remember this friend of mine, he came to me. He was, he was totally into the party scene. He, he took drugs, he, he was getting drunk every weekend, he was going home with a different girl every weekend. That was his whole scene, and he was a friend of mine, and he came to me one time, and he said, Fraser, you know what? You know what your problem is since you became a Christian? He said, since you became a Christian, you don't have any fun anymore. He says, but your life is all about restriction. That's what he said to me. Since you became a Christian, it's all about restriction, because before that, I was all about that stuff. And he said, since you become a Christian, You don't have fun anymore. It's all about restriction. I looked at him, his friend of mine. He said, you know what? I said, I take all the drugs I want to. I get drunk as much as I want to. I party as much as I want to. I I go home with as many women as I want to. I said, the difference is, Jesus Christ has changed my want to. That stuff I used to want to do, Jesus Christ came into my life and I don't want to anymore. He made a change on the inside and he set my heart in a different direction. Here's the problem for all of us. When you first become a Christian, you realize that. But as time goes on, the big magnet of the world tries to pull you back. It tries to, the big thing in the world tries to brainwash you back into thinking that that stuff is actually important after all. And you might be a Christian, but now you think, well, I will not be happy unless I have the latest pair of shoes or drive the newest car or if I'm not seen at the right places. And we start to get pulled back into this stuff about what's actually important. Paul says, you want your happiness to go up? You have to ask yourself, what's important? Because here's the trap. Write this down. Here's the trap when it comes to this one. Simply this. Popular culture. Popular culture. Every day, there are thousands of advertising messages that tell you, you're not worth anything unless you buy our product. Hey, everybody, look over here. This should matter to you. And you're like, oh, should it? Oh, this should matter to me. Oh, tells me on the TV that it should matter to me. Right, well, then this should matter to me. We're surrounded by that kind of messaging. Even television news. Television news makes it seem like what they're telling you is the most important thing ever. It's not. It really isn't. 
There's nothing as worthless as yesterday's newspaper. That's why you line your kitty, kitty litter thing with yesterday's newspaper. The world tells you that because it's immediate and it's current, that it must be important. No. Listen to me, everyone, all young people, listen to me. Just because it's new, just because it's cool, just because it's the latest, doesn't mean it's important. What's actually important is stuff that's been around for a long time and the stuff that will go on forever. That's what's actually important. I look around and I think America is consumed in the world's biggest game of trivial pursuit. Right? Pursuing the trivial. Living for things that don't matter. And it is so countercultural. And by the way, countercultural will make you more happy. You notice the world's not happy? Go countercultural and see your happiness go up by saying, you know what? Is this thing going to matter a month from now? Is, the, is, is this thing going to matter a week from now? Is it, but certainly, is it going to matter in eternity? No, it's not. It just doesn't matter. I'm sweating the small stuff. I'm losing my joy over little details in life. It doesn't matter. And Paul says, you have to learn that all that stuff is worth nothing. And in verse 8 and verse 9, he says it again. This is a famous part. He says, everything else is worthless when compared. And this is it, when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I may have Christ and become one with him. Hey, circle that word garbage. That's an interesting word. The Bible was originally written in the Greek language, not in English. And the translators here, well, they were a little bit scared. The, the translators, when they took it from Greek to English, they were a little bit afraid to tell you what this word really actually means. So they put it in garbage, because that's like the politically correct word. That's the polite version of the word. The real word means, and uh, how shall I say it? Manure. Dung. What Paul is saying here is, is that after I became a Christian, after I began a relationship with Jesus Christ, once I stopped that religion thing with all the trying to behave myself, rules and regulations, when I started the relationship thing, he said all that stuff that I used to worry about, that I used to get uptight about, all of that stuff is nothing but poop. <laughs> That's what that word means. In the original context. All of that doesn't matter. Compared to knowing Jesus. And being at one with him. Here's the third habit. That we build into our day. That Paul teaches us. If I want to see my happiness go up. Then every day. I have to get to know Jesus a little better. Get to know Jesus better. You should start every morning. When you wake up saying. Lord if I don't get anything else done today. I want to know you a little bit better. And I want to love you a little bit more. You say, well, wh how, why is that important? Listen, because the very reason that you were created, the very reason that you exist, is that you might have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is your first purpose in life. Amen. And if you think that you can be more joyful by doing stuff that you were not made for, then you're fooling yourself. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of things in life that will bring you momentary joy. It's great to have hobbies. It's great to spend time with people that you like. It's great to try new adventures and eat nice food and all that. That's all great, and that can bring you joy. But if you want to experience a lasting joy, you have to be involved in the one thing that you were created to do. And that is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Paul discovered that. He writes it in verse 10. In verse 10 of our passage, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings to become like him. 
Now, here's the thing about knowing Christ, is you have to understand the difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. He says, I want to know Christ. But you know what? You can know about someone. Like, I know about Justin Bieber. I know about Kim Kardashian. I know more about them than I really wish that I knew. But I know about them, but I don't know them. I've never met them. I don't know them, but I know a lot about them. But I do know my kids. I know my kids because I spent time with them. And I've raised them and I've watched them grow and I've watched them develop. I know them. I don't just know about them. I know them. And Paul says, I don't just want to know about Jesus. I want to know him. And I want to become like him. I love how the amplified version of this verse, it's on the screen. This is another translation. The amplified says this. For my determined purpose is that I may know Christ that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more strongly and more clearly. Circle that phrase, determined purpose. Is that in your notes? My determined purpose. What does that tell me? It tells me that you don't get to know Jesus by accident. Right? You don't just wake up one day being close to Jesus. He says, this is my determined purpose. I'm not going to wait that one day I'll just accidentally be close to Jesus. He said, this is my determined purpose. You know what that means? You have to invest time. And that's true in any relationship that you have. You want a relationship to develop? You have to invest the time that it takes. And if you want to grow close to God. Listen, if you ever meet somebody who has a strong relationship with Jesus, you can know that they've spent considerable time and investment in pursuing that relationship, that they've prayed, that they've read the Bible, that they've worshiped songs, that that, that they've read Christian books, that they've listened to podcasts, that they've been in small groups, that they've been in about it. You know they've dedicated time and energy and money because you don't become mature in Jesus by any other method. There's not a pill that you can take There's not a special conference you can go to. There's not a church where you can just, you know, lay at the altar and get the quiver and the shakes and wake up and be close to Jesus. That's not how it works. All those things can be good, but it takes time and effort. Like every other relationship. Hey, can I tell you something? Look at the back inside uh, of your church program. Would you look at the back inside where it says design for life? This is the backbone of our church. The design for life process. This is a personal, purposeful, progressive way to get to know God better and better. And we designed this specifically with you in mind. There are five classes here at CrossCurrent that take you through this. Let me just show you what it is like. This first class we call day one. That is about knowing Christ and joining the family. Day two is about growing in Christ. And learning how to talk to him and pray and read the Bible. Day three is about serving Christ. And finding about the gifts and talents that he gave you. Day four is about sharing Christ and learning how to give your testimony. And on it goes and on it goes. And this was designed for you to help you grow in your faith. Which step are you at? By the way, on October 6th, there's a day one. If you've never taken day one yet, October 6th is a day one. And then there's also a day two coming September 15th. By the way, there's a trap for this one too. What is the trap when it comes to spending time getting to know Jesus? And it's super easy. Write this in. Busyness. Just busyness. We just get too busy. By the way, busyness destroys any relationship. Destroys your relationship with your husband, your wife, your kids, your your family. Destroys any relationship when you don't spend time with it. And it's the same with Jesus. To get to know Jesus more and more. And by the way, this doesn't take a lot of time. If you just set aside 15 minutes a day in the morning, you know. By the way, you know this. That in any relationship, it's not that it takes hours and hours every day. But even just a a short time every day just to connect. 
to share a little bit about your day. You know that with your, your husband or wife or your kids. Just a little bit of connection is important. But that time has to be focused time. You're not connecting with your space when you're also on your laptop, right? He's not really listening when he's reading the paper. And it is the same with Jesus. You have to focus, whether it's in the morning, the evening, the afternoon, whatever is best for you. But here's what you have to do. You have to do what the Bible says. I think it's Psalm 46. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Now, I know that frightens some of you because you're just busy all the time. And I see it. You're just busy, busy, busy from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. He says, but if you want to know that I am God, you have to sit still. So day two is coming, and that's all about how you can learn to do this. I hope that you'll sign up. Let me go to the fourth habit that Paul gives us for happiness in our lives. If you want to be happier, number four, you have to review where I need to grow. Review where I need to grow. This is about a little personal evaluation, a little daily checkup. Take your spiritual pulse. You can do this during that 15-minute quiet time where you just say to the Lord, Lord, what do I need to work on? Where am I weak? Where where do you want to make me a little bit stronger? Here's a good verse. This verse is from Psalm 139. This would be a great verse to memorize. The psalmist says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my thoughts. And see if there is anything evil or wicked in my life. And lead me in the way that's everlasting. That'd be a great verse to memorize, to utter each morning. Say, Lord, would you just do a little little spiritual EKG? Do a little heart check up on me. Would you just tell me, Holy Spirit, what do I need to do better? What do I need to change? What do I need to work on? How can I grow a little bit more? Because here's what you have to know. That following Jesus is both a decision and a process. It's, there, there has to come a moment in every person's life where they make their own decision. Yes, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And that's called being born again. Being converted. Becoming a follower of Jesus. You need to make that decision. But after you've made that decision, it doesn't just stop there. There's a process for the rest of your life. God will continue to work in you and through you and with you as he changes you from one degree degree of glory to the next. But listen, God loves you exactly the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you that way. Remember the the, the old, Jesus, I come just as I am? Yeah, he, he, he takes you just as you are and then loves you through the change. A lot of you have made the decision, but you haven't continued in the process. Some of the men in particular. You, you, you started, you got in on it, you, you, you prayed the prayer, you invited Jesus into your life, you started with the event, but you haven't continued with the process. You've said, I I trust Jesus for my salvation. I know that I'm going to go to heaven on, not on my own merit, but on the blood of Jesus Christ. I know that, but can I be honest with you? You haven't really grown beyond that. It's like, like, I heard this story about a mom, this mom, she heard a thud in the middle of the night. So she goes into the bedroom and finds that her son has fallen out of the bed onto the floor. And she said to him, how did you do that? And he said, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. <laughs> and for many of you, you've stayed too close to where you got in. You've invited Jesus to save you, but you haven't continued on this process. And you're still way back at the beginning and you're immature in your Christian life. You're saved, but you're not growing. 
And this is why we need this step, this daily checkup, to ask ourselves, Lord, what do, what do I need to work on? Where do I need to grow? Do I have to work on anger? Do I, do I have to work on more patience? Do I need to get rid of jealousy? Do I need to watch the words that I'm using? And if you have this little checkup, each day the Lord will speak with you. Now look at verse 12. This is an incredible verse, verse 12 of our passage, Philippians 3. Paul says this, I don't mean to say that I'm perfect. I still haven't learned all that I should, but I keep working towards that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and all that he wants me to be. No, dear brothers, I am still not all that I should be. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I'm not what I want to be, but at least I'm not what I used to be. That God is still working on me. And the reason I think this is incredible is because I think about who's saying it. This is written by the MVP of Christianity. This, this is the Hall of Famer. This guy founded the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame was invented for this guy. This guy wrote more books of the New Testament than anyone else. This is, this is the guy. And he says, still haven't made it. Can I tell you something? When he wrote this, he's an, an older man. He's an older man in prison. He's mature. He's been walking with God for years. And he says, you know what? I'm not perfect and I haven't learned it all. But I'm still working on it. I'm still in the process. But I know that eventually that I'll be all that God wants me to be. Now, what's the trap? What's the trap against this constant growing? Write this in. It's pride. Pride is the trap against constant growing. Because when I get to this prideful place where I pretend that I've got it all together and that I don't have to, to keep developing and I don't have to keep growing, when I pretend that I'm a mature Christian when I'm really not, I'm not helping anyone, including myself, can I give you a little secret? Come on, everyone, lean in for the secret. You ready? Lean in for the secret. Everybody watching on the internet, <laughs> lean in for a second. The rest of us, we already know that you don't have it all together. <laughs> right? The rest of us, we see you. We already know that you're not perfect. We already know that you've got areas to grow in. Who are you kidding? You're not kidding us. And you're certainly not kidding God. You're just kidding yourself. It's happy people that never stop growing. People that are happy are the ones who realize, you know what, I can learn something from everyone. Happy people are the people who say, I'm, all, I'm still in a process. I'm still in a journey. Every year I'm trying to learn something new. I'm trying to, to develop a new practice. Every year I'm trying something different. Every year I'm developing and developing and developing. That's happy people. Unhappy people are prideful people who say, I don't have to change. You just take me as I am, like it or not. By the way, I've told you this. If someone ever says to you, that's just the way I am, take it or leave it. I would suggest leave it. <laughs> Paul writes this elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. He says this, test yourself to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. He says you need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. And if you fail the test, do something about it. That's from the message. Your happiness will go up if you keep on growing. Here's the fifth and final habit from chapter 3 of Philippines. Paul says, if you want your happiness to go up, here you have to do this. Forget what can't be changed and focus on the future. If you want your happiness to go up, you have to learn to forget what's in the past and start looking forward. Your past is in the past. That's why it's called the past. It's in the past. It's gone. It's over. It's done. And all the worrying in the world will not change the past at all, not one bit. You don't have a time machine. You can't go back and do it any different. And even if it was the, the dumbest, stupidest thing you've ever done, 
And even if the consequences were great, we can't change it. We just can't change it anymore. So what are we going to do? Or should we just sit around and mope and moan and complain about that dumb thing you did? Will we just, will we just gather around and you can stand there and the rest of us will just kick you? Will that make you feel better? Will, will I buy you something you can just keep whipping yourself about it for? Is that going to work? For you to keep looking back a year or five years or ten years to that one time, that stupid, dumb decision that you made, and it resulted in changes for your whole life, and you go, ah, oh, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that? Totally ruined everything. Okay, you could do that every day. And not only will it not change that event, it won't make you feel any better. So part of happiness is learning to just go, you know what? It is what it was. I can't change it. I can't go back now and do it any different. I can't go back and not say what I said. I can't go back and not see that person I saw. I can't go back and not have that relationship that I had. I can't change it. So why continue to beat myself up about it? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I wish I'd done it differently. I really do. I wish I'd done it differently. But I can't change it. So why keep going on about it? You know the word repentance, the Greek word metanoia? What that literally means, this translation means to change your mind. That's the literal meaning of the word, is to change your mind. It means to be going in one direction, to turn and go the other direction. And you need to repent of those things. No, that... that don't hear me through your Christian ears. <laughs> through your, oh, I've heard this. No, no, no. I didn't say you need to whip yourself and feel bad about it. Because that's not what repentance means. But you do need to change your mind about what happened. And you need to stop looking back, beating yourself up, and feeling guilt and shame about it, and say, you know what, I can't change it. I'm going to change my mind now. And I'm going to do what Paul says. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, I am focusing all my energies on this one thing. Now, here's how many of you read this. I'm focusing some of my energy on many things. He says, I'm focusing all my energy on one thing. And what is that? Forgetting the past and looking forward that's where he said all my energy is forgetting the past and looking forward you only have a limited amount of energy you don't have unlimited energy that's why you get tired that's why you get fatigued that's why you get worn out you don't have unlimited energy and so the energy that you do have he says you have to focus it i am focusing the energy And so what you don't have is the time to waste any of that energy on the past. Would you like to change the past? Yeah, yeah, would. Can you? No. So forget it. Forget it. Use all that emotional energy that you do have on moving forward. Now, this habit, I'm finishing with this, this habit is so important there are three traps. There's three traps, because this one, this is one of the ones where the, they really want to get you. So let me give you them quickly. Number one, the first trap is the trap of regrets. Regrets. It's hard to let go of the past if you keep holding on to regrets, right? All that stuff I wish I'd done differently. Now, listen, we all second guess ourselves. All of us do. Are there things in my, way, in my life that I wish I'd done differently? Absolutely. Of course there are. But I can't dwell on them. Because the past is past and I can't change it. It's done. So I'm not going to waste any time on it. So you've got to watch the trap of regret. Forget about it. Here's the second trap when it comes to forgetting the past. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. This is about the stuff that other people have done to you. Now, you've done bad stuff, but also other people have done bad stuff to you. 
And what can happen is with the stuff that they've done to you is it can build up to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. But either way, it gets you stuck in the past. I told you this many times, that holding on to resentment is just dumb. It's just dumb. Let me spell it out to you. Because you ain't hurting anybody but yourself. Right? The whole time that you're thinking about him, the whole time you're thinking about her and what happened and what they did, you know what they're doing? They're having a steak dinner. They're not even thinking about you. They don't even care about you and what you're doing. Some of those people are already dead. And while you keep churning it up in your mind, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play, those people that hurt you, they don't give a rip. So who are you really hurting? Them? No. Holding on to that resentment is like drinking poison and hoping that they die. You only hurt yourself. Now, you say, but they don't deserve it. No, they don't. You're right. But they don't deserve my forgiveness. No, they do not deserve your forgiveness. But guess what? You don't deserve God's forgiveness. You don't. And if he's been gracious to forgive you, then you have to be gracious to forgive them. Unforgiveness. And the third and final trap with this one. This will surprise you. It's the trap of tradition. I thought about this for a while. Here's the, the famous seven last words. We have always done it that way. It's the famous seven last words. We have always, is that seven? <laughs> we have always done it that way. Seven. Have you noticed that things keep changing? That every day things change? Have you noticed that your body's changing? <laughs> am, I just at that, am I just getting to that age? Your body's changing. Relationships are changing. The weather's changing. Culture is changing. Everything is constantly changing. And you can't stop it. You can't stop change. So you have to decide, I can either get mad and resist and resent the changes that are happening, or I can choose to be happy. That's my choice. Happiness is a choice, right? Oh, your kids are changing. They're growing up. They're going off to college. Or, or now your kid, you're an empty nester. Things are changing. Things are changing. Well, you can gripe and complain about it, or you can choose to be happy. Because happiness is a choice. And you're as happy as you choose to be. By the way, how you handle change in life reveals your spiritual maturity. But you've never heard that before. A lot of people don't like change. But how you handle that, in part, reveals how connected you are to God. Because the more connected to God you are, it means that you're more connected to that which is eternal and so you realize that the changes that happen down here don't really matter much. Right? Because in the grand scheme of things, in the eternal perspective, these changes don't really matter. So let's have the band come up and prepare. And I want to show you one more verse. This is from the Old Testament from a prophet named Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18. God tells us this. He says, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. For see, I am doing a new thing. And that's our fifth habit, to forget the past and move forward. I want to pray with you. So would you bow your heads for a moment? Let's bow our heads. You know, happiness is a choice. But in many ways, it, it's a matter of the habits that you choose to develop. And these five habits that we've looked at today, you can do them all in just 15 minutes a day during your quiet time. And so as we bow our heads and come before God, I, I challenge you to make this commitment right now. I'm going to pray. Why don't you just say this in your mind? Say, Dear God, I want to learn to relax in your grace each day. To not try and earn your approval, but to realize you already love me. You'll never love me any less or any more than you already do. 
And so I reject legalism, trying to prove my worth by rules and regulations. And I want to live by grace and be gracious to everybody else. Then Lord, would you help me focus every day on what matters most? Not to believe the advertisements, not to spend and waste and worry my life on things that aren't going to matter even a week from today, much less in eternity. And dear God, I want to know Jesus Christ more. That every day I want to, to, to know you a little bit more and love you. And Lord, teach me to have those little daily checkups to say, Lord, where do I need to focus? Where do I need to grow? What needs to change? And then lastly, help me, Lord, to forgive what can't be changed, to forget about it in the past and to let it go and instead focus in the future. If you're here today and you've never opened up your life to Jesus Christ, why don't you just say, Jesus Christ, come into my life right now. I want to get to know you. I want to, to love you, to trust you. I don't want religion. I want a relationship with you. So come into my life. And if you prayed that prayer, God hears your prayers. If you meant it, then you just stepped across the line. But don't stay too close to where you got in. Father, I thank you for your word, that it's practical, it's relevant, that it leads us to the happy life that you want us to have as we learn to live with a focus on eternity. And so I pray a blessing on all of our church family in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.